Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Um, there's, I, I'm assuming there's still some space on the open mic sign-up sheet, which is on the back counter there, um, if you would like to sign up to read up to seven minutes of your work. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm really excited also to introduce Lisa Roulard. Um, Lisa is coming to us from Salt Lake, right? Is that where you're living? Salt Lake. Um, a few years ago, uh, <clears throat> I met Lisa in a conference called Writers at Work Conference, which is an amazing conference that everybody should go if you can afford it. <laughs> it's kind of expensive. Um, but we were working with Heather McHugh, which was this, she's an amazing poet, MacArthur Genius Award and all this stuff. And so we were reading and I hear Lisa read her work and I thought, damn, she's good. So I was not surprised at all when Lisa won the uh, Utah Arts Council Original Writing Contest a couple of years ago. And now I'm just thrilled to have heard her read last year at that uh, award ceremony. And I thought we got to get Lisa up here, and we have, so I'm really excited, Lisa. Um, she was born and raised in Seattle, and she earned her MFA in Creative Writing at Eastern Washington University. Her poetry has appeared in various magazines, including Brain, Child, New Orleans Review, and Literal Latte. Her work has also appeared on buses in Boise, Idaho, as part of Poetry in Motion. That's awesome. In 2013, she won the U Utah Original Writing Competition for Poetry. She lives in Salt Lake City with her family, a trio of book lovers. As often as possible, she walks in the rain. Welcome, Lisa. State University English Department and Helicon West for inviting me up. When I first met uh, Star and Shannon a few years ago, I, I just I was thrilled to begin to have writer friends here in Utah. I've lived in Utah just five years, and and so it's really wonderful to be here um, tonight and be part of this series. I'm going to read from poems that are collecting into a book. I hope. Um, titled The Mailman in the Forest. Uh, this first poem shares that title. Uh, in it is a bird I refer to as the Dipper. Uh, it is the American Dipper, which does live here in Utah, and it's most known for its ability to swim upstream underwater. I did a bird project, I think in fifth grade, and my dad took me out to the University of Washington to go to the libraries there, which was much um, far and beyond what needed to be done for a fifth grade bird project. But we researched, uh, found someone's dissertation on the wing structure of the dipper um, so I could collect some facts from my report. So it's always been a favorite of mine. The Mailman in the Forest. A kind of uncertainty, of intention, of no GPS. The mailman has his mail shoes and he is on foot. He supports his safari-esque hat. These are the woods, reaching and damp. The details could bite you alive. Here, in a swath of white water cold, a bird walks underwater upstream. He swims, too, for prey, slate-colored this dipper who bobs from rocks out singing the singing river. Does the mailman have the mail? You cannot see the truck. Light meanders, evergreen. No route like a Sunday. No boxes or slots. This poem was inspired by a woman I used to work with who told me she 
mailman either saw her skinny dipping or she saw a mailman while she was skinny dipping, something to that effect. <laughs> and I thought that that was a funny detail to learn from someone I worked with. But <laughs> I put it in a poem because you can do that. Um, and you don't even necessarily have to tell anyone. You've done it. It's called Skinny Dipping with Mailman. Quarry Lake, end of the pothole road, and a girl skinny dipping. Something to be mailed, that possibility. And she is, her sundress and envelope waiting. Strawberry blonde, freckled limbed. She's the letter composed in someone's head. The mailman's maybe. He's seated on granite that's warming. Apple clasped by left hand. The right flips crisp magazines. Neither knows the other, nor notices. She slips through bluest green. When a letter's sent, mom, auntie, lover, can't always know it's coming. The fluttering thrill, girlhood, summer, and the freedom of the to be written. The dear, how are you? Unobserved, naked, swimming. This next poem is the first male-related poem that I wrote. Um, and it's ended up creating a series of poems of an image of a first date as if it were on a postage stamp. <laughs> Which when I thought of it was delightfully absurd because who would want that? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and I, I've always wondered how it is that the subjects for stamps come to be because they're very eclectic, which is part of, I think, what's interesting. But, and this came to me after, after being married when I no longer had to have dating in my life. And so I think only then was it fun to write about, because <laughs> it wasn't actually happening. So this first poem is set at a location that my brother showed me. I can't remember if he told me he took a girl there, but that was the inspiration. Postage stamps, the first date series, below train tracks, Bellingham, Washington. For Ryan. Creosote air, a space sized for two. For sunken ships, he tells her, no responsibilities remain. Down trail at the bay, the tide subtracting. Is this a place to bring a girl? Weight thrown grit, tracks and timbers tightly tacked. The dog you can't see barking. I continued writing more poems into the world of mail and out of the world of mail. Um, the mailman leaving it and me entering it. I began to imagine myself as different elements um, in, in mail, related to the world of mail. And this one is called When I Am a Stamp. As a long landscape rectangle, I will bask, I will window. This image and just this Aspen, aspen, spiriting leaves, frog green, brushed into being by breeze, all lilt, lift, shimmy tickle. Aboard the envelope, I dream straightforward in verbs, affix, not stick, mail, cancel, deliver. One job, one job only, essential, a signature. This letter cannot become mail without me, rooted grove of self-adhesive trees. <clears throat> before the mailman, before the recipient, the letter writer set eyes on my gentle electric scene and saw what my artist saw, felt what isn't shown, sunlight on shoulders, thought of the one he'd written, then pressed fingers against me. of mine who was reading some of my mail poems said his grandfather used to be a mailman and that he he thought I should have some dog poems because mailman you know his grandpa would talk about the dogs on the route and their you know their situations and so I'm not a dog person you know I didn't grow up having a dog I hope to never live with a dog 
<laughs> but I started writing these dog poems based on different significant interactions with dogs that I've had, and it's turned out to be a lot of fun. Um, so this one is called Slipknot of Dog Logic. Smoke, pro smoke coat, and improvement in velvet. The dog, Weimariner, liquid leaps up. No sidling, no time for thought. I just sunk in, sofa, just self-commanded up, and he was, into a space that almost wasn't. Still tall, don't tell him I said this, a greyhound of angles. Four paw pivot, a vertical disappearance, while I flapped a bit and with end of the day tone said, no, no oh, buddy, with those ears, soft ears won't hold. Then, as exclamation, as claiming, a knot slipped of itself, he unhinges, expands very proper his origami he creates as card table across and beyond and over my lap i become woman surrender embracing dog there's no question but he already knew that <laughs> okay i've got another date poem on a stamp which i've forgotten about until i came across the file on my computer, does this happen to you? You think, oh, what's this? And you open it up and go, oh, that. I'm not sure I want to remember that. <laughs> so this one is based on an actual date. It's called Postage Stamp, the first date series. Excuse me. A wine bar, Spokane, Washington. Yes, it's strange being titled and framed. The man speaking and going on and on began, she thinks, before there was before. He's waterfall roar, Niagara perpetual. He leans in to her incessant listening. She prays for precedent that any date who talks so much, four generations, the same small town, how much is there to say? <laughs> Can be deftly duct taped. USA forever and the scalloped edges to carry such words in case the letter doesn't. <laughs> this poem was based on the dog sitting experience, except dog sitting was called house sitting when I did it. The houses were always fine. It's the dogs. <laughs> dogs that had the challenges. Um, this dog did not like the mailman, which really didn't prove to be a problem. I'm glad it wasn't my mail because it always had bite marks in it. And you'll find out why in the poem. <laughs> mail slot. Before, it was only his bark that broke through the mail slot. Bite like, jackhammer, the backup mailman, six steps from the door, or this breakthrough's part snout, black tipped, a sunlit canine chisel, strong gloves, a how-to on delivering mail to this pastureless house, its border collie seized with a certainty like herding. The mailman, the collie, their jobs much the same. Keep what's been assigned where it should be and together. Grunt work of sense, taming the ordinary. The hand shoves mail and the dog must back up. He bites at the air, the white flock of new lambs, unread and scattering. The mailman in the bathtub. A place to steam letters, he thinks, one toe about in, the door locked, the faucet hard over, the water broth hot. To hold the seal there, just at the streaming tap could be side work, off the route, like this bath at last. Opening each envelope could yield a tidy sigh, self-directed and privileged, the little song of an address. Why these phrases come into my head, like the mailman about the, I cannot explain. <laughs> my mother says, where does this come from? I say, I do not. <laughs> it just happens and I write it down. Okay, the 11074 in this next 
poem, which is called When I Am a Mailbox, was the house number of my address where I lived uh, growing up in Seattle by the beach. When I Am a Mailbox. Suited to this solitude, this stillness, I'll be practitioner of patience, shaper of space. I'll be a nest or a harbor galvanized, postmaster approved. Truth, I can't write letters, but under the season's spin, I'll excel at assistance. It's still correspondence, the proper tool placed in the hand. My trinity, sender, mailman, recipient. Galvanized, as I said, may that offer protection from firecracker and bat. There's prayer, I suppose, to prevent being furloughed that fantastic stagnancy or getting witched in by decades old hedges. How I'll love 11074, <coughs> Puget Sound's wet turns, the mail truck's gentle approach, my one sweet door from which mail slides in, slides out like a paper tide. And the moon stuck fast most nights, hosting the sky, single wing of a bird, my flag. I really believe that letter writing was how I fell in love with writing. And I just thought as a child that it was so wonderful that you could write some, write to someone, put their specific information on there, put it out in the box, and then it was someone else's dedicated job to take it to that special someone. And that you never knew when you were going to open the box that there will be something there for you. And I still just think that's a delight. Uh, a delightful thing. My husband was gone. He's a hydrologist. He does snow, snow surveys in, in the state. He was on a backpacking trip for work last week and he came home and he said, I wrote you a letter. And I got pages one, three, and four on the back of, a, of some kind of geological maps. But that he wrote to me while he was, you know, sitting in the tent away from the bugs. So um, it was wonderful to hear about your letter writing because I think the correspondence has a, a really critical role in relationships. And the email, it's not completed <laughs> for me. Okay, two more. Now, this is a poem I wrote for my dad. We did a lot of hiking and camping when I was growing up. And my dad, a lot of mountaineering before that time. And he had a lot of, he would buy things to go mountaineering with at the military surplus store. So we hiked with these, you know, government surplus canteens. Um, and that's what this poem I have one in my office. I'd still use it if it was full of water, but that's what inspired this poem. It's for my dad. Canteen. I filled it from moss-edged streams, was taught to catch the cold and clear from the rushing, to fill the curved metal body, then my own, and after to secure the black screw-on lid while swiveling free the chain. When I didn't blaze the trail, braided spark, I followed my dad, never losing track of his backpack's pocket straps. Not the stream's rhythm, that soft canvas tapping, but that of footsteps, pace, the way he gave himself to the trail, expected, arc after arc, firm. In the pack, jostled whatever we might need, band-aids, red vines, finger-sized cylinder of waterproof matches, Granny Smith's and ham sandwiches, a Nikon in a leather case, one spare roll of film, two canteens. To me, all this was the way most things should matter. Self-propelled, self-sufficient, but not alone. We'd rest on the stillness of rocks, one of us untying the pack's hand-worn cord then pull out the canteens, scarred but solid like my dad. When I held mine, it used to be his. I thought of his hands with their scatter of moon-like scars, where that went on long before I caught my soft reflection in its silver curve. So far, my hands wore his radiant map of veins. Pine needles celebrated our boots. The air tasted evergreen. This is a new mailman poem. Um, my daughter last week, I wrote it last week, and 
she got home from school one day, she's in second grade, and I said, oh, I wrote the mailman in the pear tree today. And she said, Mom, is that mailman getting anything delivered? <laughs> I don't need to answer that. <laughs> I saw the mailman bump into the pear tree. <laughs> he was on his way. In this poem, um, there is a play on the term par avion, which means uh, air mail or by airplane in French. The mailman and the pear tree. He'd realized only tree, not pears. So it wasn't deep enough in his knee bend to pass under freely. His blue mail shirt, like a second sky swinging up to the branches. And the pears, little riddles of women, gold green and etched speckled, announced themselves like stealthy percussion, one fruit plunking in the mouth of the mailbag, pear avion warm, unnoticed. In the leafy edges of air, the mailman stops, sidesteps, straightens. Each pair so unlike an envelope, he thinks, as some weight near his street-worn shoes and more above him sway. Excuse me. Yet each arrives sealed and stored with messages, one from each seed's letter the ripening hope of trees. Thank you. Mm -hmm.